I'm so excited to bring you two phenomenal guests, Kyle Kruger and Wilkie Law. Kyle is a middle school social studies teacher in the Twin Cities, and Wilkie Law is a math teacher and instructional coach in Houston, Texas. Both these gentlemen have a nonprofit called Lighthouse Educator Development, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but also we're going to talk about leadership and an after-school program that they've created to really enhance student creativity. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. All right, Aspire listeners, you are in for a treat because I have two amazing podcasters with me. I have Kyle and Wilkie. And gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for being on the Aspire to Lead podcast. To, um, you know, thank you so much for having us. And also, too, um, we've been in the process of working with you to get our podcast, which um, has gone through several names, but is is going to be called that when we relaunch this summer, we teach inspired onto the Teach Better Network. So we're super appreciative of that, man. And thanks for having us. Absolutely. We're really excited. I, I told you before, I've been really excited about getting back into podcasting and getting to have conversations with people because I believe that's how you really move things through education uh, is having those conversations. So thank you for inviting us. My pleasure. Yeah. And I, I even, you know, have been thinking over the course, I mean, cause we started recording podcasts like 2016, 2017. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking back before we came on, I was like, I can tell the ebb and flow of how I felt about my teaching and about the craft with how consistently we were doing podcasts hmm. and how much, how much we gained ourselves from interviewing others. Cause it can be, and, and I found myself in this space over the last couple of years where you just get so inside your own head yep. and you get so wrapped up in what you're thinking, but to, you know, the times where we've interviewed teachers and, and had those conversations, it just, it fills you up so much. So this is, making me aspire to get back to our podcast and, and to continue to do the, the things that we've done to not necessarily have a successful podcast, but to be successful educators, because that's more what it's about than anything. Yeah. And I loved our conversations before, Colin. You guys have such a passion to help others. And I think that's what you know drew me into your podcast. And I'm so excited to have you guys on the Teach Better Podcast Network. I'm, I'm ready to get it on the website and then share you know, what you all are doing because you two are, are passionate about helping others and helping other educators. And, and I'm so excited to have you part of the, the Teach Better family. And let's let's relaunch. Let's get that going. Yes. I can't wait. Yes, Absolutely. for sure. Well, I want to talk about a few things, but uh, Wilkie, I'm going to throw this to you, man, because I am super excited to hear about your music program because I know you're real passionate about increasing creativity with your students and you've created, sounds like a really powerful after school program. So w- will you share kind of what your vision was with that and what the program's all about? Yeah, well, let's start with, I'm a self-taught piano player. I have the transcript to prove that I went to college on a music scholarship, but I failed beginning piano. And I was the principal piano player in our jazz band. So riddle me that, how that works and goes together. But I found that a lot of students and a lot of students who are creators, they find themselves stuck into the regular running a meal of everything. You have to do choir or you have to do band. You know, you have to pick up an instrument when their their voice could be their instrument that they want to project to the world, not just singing some rudiments in, in a choir classroom. Maybe they don't want to be a part of a choir, but that's the only option that they have. Knowing my struggles and the fact that I only got in band to explore my musical abilities, and then going to college, I started producing music. And when I started producing music, again, self-taught piano player that just understood I play by ear. So it was easy for me to start produ- you know, getting into production. And when I started working at a middle school, Kyle and I have been talking back and forth and I was like, man, I really want to put this with the kids. I want to see how it works. And first year, I think we had, what, 25 kids. Second year, we had over 70 kids audition. And so we call it a collective, the Music and Arts Collective, because it is a true embodiment of bringing different creators together in one space and giving everybody an opportunity to kind of freely express themselves, you know, from the music production side, vocal singing, rapping, teaching them how to write the songs, teach them how to do photography, breaking into videography, 
You know, we also have an art program with kids who love to draw. I have a wall right now in my room that I'm taking down with kids artwork on that they just give it to me where they're drawing all these different characters. And that's not, a, there's not enough medium for them in middle school to really kind of express themselves through that. And so we wanted to create a collective that's run really by the students. You know, and this over the last two or three years, I've been, where we've been in talks of partnering with uh, Workshop Houston, uh, a prominent program here in Houston uh, that focuses on not just the music, they also do dance and fashion, and also they do restorative justice and restorative circles. And so that's something next year that we're going to branch into to doing our own version of that and eventually moving that program to a standalone program within a community, uh, not just connected to one school. Uh, and so that's like I say, this year, even with the, this was the, kind of our first real launch because COVID had us for two years. And so for two years, we didn't do the program. And most of those students that started with me had already gone off to high school. And so this was the year, the kind of our rebuild year to bring kids in. And we got 24 kids in this year and 18 of them are returning. So they'll be seventh and eighth graders next year. So I'm super excited. The program is expanding. We're going from two days a week to four days a week and potentially going into three different schools. So that is going to be a huge, tremendous uh, boost for the program to, in order to show that not only there's a need, but look at the benefits that come out of it. You know, you'll see a decrease in student aggression. You'll see a decrease in students' uh, misbehavior in the, in the hallways because they, they are part of something. And, you know, we, we talk about it all the time, like, hey, when you get in trouble, you're not just standing for yourself because they're going to say those are those Mac students. And so we take a sense of pride in the fact that if you're wearing this brand and this is what you're saying you're part of, then there's a certain way that you have to conduct yourself. And our kids have, have stepped up to that, even for decorating of their own board. They did it on their own. You know, they wanted to create their own program. They wanted to do their own videos for different things and create their own songs, write their songs from scratch instead of doing cover songs, you know? And so that whole process for them, they're taking the ownership. So next year when we have the auditions, I'm expecting next year that it'll explode to, you know, maybe 70, 80 kids per campus. And I guess I'm, I'm, I can't be more excited for what the kids have done. I mean, to be able to see 12, 13, 14 year old kids who can walk away with a skill that not only gives them the freedom to express themselves, but also potentially can make, make them money. You know, because we do also talk about publishing. We talk about, you know, how to, how to register your music, how to create your own name and create your persona, how to get your songs on TikTok and Instagram. These kids are really buying into the idea that this is something I can really, really do. And I jumped the gun. I didn't even ask you, like, what you're doing on your campus or about your education <laughs> journey. I just was so excited to, to learn about what you're doing on your campus. But Will you just give us a little bit of background on yourself, Wilkie, uh, what you're doing right now and, and uh, how you got into education? Yeah, I'm a 15-year veteran educator, born and raised here in Houston, Texas. Education was like my third career choice. Uh, I didn't go into it easily. Uh, I actually went through an alternative certification program, and it came about because my daughter was born. I was working in the private sector in education for Kaplan University, and the time was just so... I would go to work before my daughter wakes up, come home. By the time I get home, she's asleep. And so I just said, hey, let me, let me try teaching. If I'm already in the education space as a, I was a director of student services, I was like, let me go ahead and try education. So I became a substitute and a paraprofessional. And then next thing you know, I just started, I loved it. I had a principal who supported me and said, hey, you should try an alternative certification program. I did it, transferred to another school, had a succession of great principals and building leaders who pushed me to really become the best teacher I can be. And like I say, now, 15 years later, uh, this will be my second time leaving the classroom again to go into leadership. And I'll be becoming the instructional specialist at a middle school campus here in Houston. And like I say, it's going to be a challenge. We have almost 1,400 students slated to being on our campus next year. And I have a team of 18 teachers. So it's going to be very interesting to, for that dynamic. But again, like I say, if it's not a challenge, then it's not worth it. Well, I'm going to throw it back over to Kyle because he's uh, in the land of 10,000 lakes and, <laughs> and uh, freezing his butt off right now. I, I know how that yeah. is growing up in Minnesota. But Kyle, I would love to hear about uh, your journey as an educator and, and what you're doing now. 
Yeah, you know, to kind of put a pin in Wilkie's story, we always joke that we were the tale of two teachers, like the book, The Tale of Two Cities, because we we come from literally polar opposite backgrounds. Um, I grew up small town, small town called Cumberland, Wisconsin, um, northwest part of the state, you know, went to a small university in Minnesota, graduated college in 2008, you know, had my teaching degree. I, I was an education major from the jump and couldn't barely even find subbing gigs that first year out. So I wound up getting recruited to Houston in the same district that Will works in and started there, spent four years at a middle school campus there teaching and coaching. I'm, I'm a social studies by trade, was there four years. And then I transferred to Will's school at what was a super pivotal time. I had kind of an unceremonious breakup at my first school. It was not explicitly said to me, but it was implied that maybe I should look for greener pastures. And it just rocked me. Like it rocked my confidence. It rocked. And as I look back on it, almost, you know, 10 years later, it rocked my identity. Like my identity was so wrapped up in my job that once I was like, felt like I wasn't good enough, it really rocked me. And it it was just such a pivotal time because I got put on the same team as Will. And steadily over time, like people just see you like he really saw me. I I see that this guy's got like he has all the makings of a good teacher but it's just not happening and he pinpointed that it wasn't my teaching skills it was what was going on with me personally and how I wasn't dealing with what was going on you know within me so over the course of those four years I was with him you know that's where our relationship built he really helped me work on myself and grow as a person like I remember the first time he started suggesting books to me like The Alchemist and, you know, As a Man Thinketh, and it it totally changed my perspective. Shortly thereafter, I moved back home. My sister had had a baby. She was about to have another baby, and it just got to be time, you know, to, to be a bigger part of my family. So now I find myself, I teach in the Twin Cities. I, this is my third year at my current school. I teach at a charter in the Twin Cities. I teach eighth grade social studies. Um, which obviously has been an adventure over the last few years, definitely, you know, and then I still, as much as we can find time, work with Will on trying to help with the Mac, which is, I mean, a program like we're so proud of, and we got a few other things in the works. I I think the most, for me, the most disappointing thing about the pandemic from a professional level was we were like really starting to hit our stride on kind of the conference circuit. After about the sixth or seventh time, I was really like getting my feet to where I could go and feel comfortable and feel confident speaking to teachers. So ultimately, that's a direction I would I, I would really like to take my career in the future is is into that professional development space, especially the new teacher mentoring. So that's where I'm at now. Recently got married over the last couple of years, you know, enjoying enjoying that part of my life. And yes, like you said, in the Twin Cities, and it was 44 degrees when I woke up. So Kyle, I want to go back to what you're talking about with your opportunity with Wilkie, because, you know, it sounds like he was kind of a mentor toward you as a teacher, helping you through a lot of different things and kind of pinpointing, you know, areas that you needed to develop. And you also talked about a passion of yours is mentoring other teachers. So I'm just curious if, you know, that experience with Wilkie kind of transformed your idea of like what you could do as a professional and and how you could guide other teachers to help them in their journey. Yeah, I mean, it almost certainly put me on the path that I'm on now, because up until that point, I thought I could keep my professional life and my personal life in two separate buckets, and that one didn't have to overlap into the other, Sure, which is a totally flawed assumption, because we know, like, if you're doing this job, really, you're carrying it with you all the time, and because you're carrying it with you, the things you do outside are going to seep into within it. And, and I think the thing that really stood out and like, I, I point to this, like, like no lie, still best buddies after 10 years, he was the best man at my wedding. Like it's, it's a genuine like friendship over, over everything else it is, but he was the truest sense of, you know, the, the root of the word mentor, mm-hmm. which was not, he was not directive he was not authoritative. It was just like, oh, hey, you should look here or you can look here. 
everything he did made me self-reflective. And I think that's why the mentorship was so powerful is because it put me on the path of Mm self-reflection, which is, I think, one of the most important skills that a teacher can possess is not just the ability, but the willingness to take the look in the mirror and, and be honest with where you're at. And for us, truly in mentorship, it was no lie, like a three year process of the time that we worked together. Like I was still doing the work. I was still doing that work. We had started the first year. So mentorship to us, when it comes to teachers is, you know, someone that really is going to stick with you over the course of that early part of your career. Ultimately, I I think 100% what I want to do as a mentor or as a coach is the carbon copy of what he did for me because he always, he, he never gave me an out. He never let me have excuses. He held me accountable, but he also empowered me by, by not giving me the steps, but more showing me a little bit of who I was and showing me a little bit of where I could go. I mean, it's, it's still, I, I tried to embody it even just when, you know, with the eighth graders that I teach. Right. And that's what I was about to say is that, you know, listening to what you're saying, and you know, it's hard to listen to someone talk about what you've done in, in their life, because I can say equally some of the same things about Kyle. I, I tell him he's the best part of me because we came from two, two totally different environments, mm-hmm. but it's like the best stuff, the stuff that I look and I strive for, I saw in him. The only difference is it was natural for him and it was a struggle for me. That's that's a good way to describe. We have <laughs> we have complementary skill sets. Right. Absolutely. I, I I think that's what makes us good just friends and partners because you're right, Will, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it, it is very much of like he does the things that I wish I could do and and makes it look easy. But I think it goes back to the classroom. I love teaching. And I think the the way I handle every situation in my life is the exact same way I handle my classroom. Mm-hmm. Is I approach it with integrity. I approach it with a sense of pride and a sense of, a sense of respect for my craft. And so because I respect my craft so much, it makes me, I like to use the word conscious observer. It makes me a conscious observer of every single thing that I do. So every interaction, I'm, I'm already in my mind. And I know some people say it's almost too deep and too, you know, you go too far with it. But at the same time, I believe every situation is going to present something that you can learn from. The problem is most of us don't look at every situation as something we can learn from. We look at every situation as something brand new. And it's really not. It's, 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 it's a, it's a re- repetitiveness of things that we haven't accomplished or things we have said we mastered and we maybe we haven't and so when Kyle was saying about how I, I I pushed him I challenged him I didn't give him an out and I think as teachers that's the same thing we have to do in the classroom whether our students are the actual students that we're teaching or in my case where it will become the the teachers that are teaching the student we have to that that sense of accountability that sense of ownership he, he accredits me for giving him books and, and giving him books to read but Half of my library right now <laughs> came from this guy, you know, so it's like, you yeah. know, when I think about it, you know, it's like, I think about the books that the extreme ownership that, that, that he said, Hey, you got to read this. And I read this book and I'm like, wow, this makes so much sense, you know, so much so that I adopted the term in my classroom own your wrong. So you can move on because a lot of kids and a lot of adults don't want to own their mistakes. Yep. And so what happens is now you're going to be forced to deal with it again. And as a mentor, the important thing as a mentor is to be just as gentle, but just as unmoved. You know, it, it's, it's like you, you have to be gentle in, in under, understanding that they may not get it the first time. So the next time they come, it can't be, see, I told you so. You can't do that. I told you you shouldn't have done it. No, it's like, okay, so now let's think about, think about it. You got the same results. What, 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 what took place? What was different? Was there a difference? And when you get to the point where you're asking questions, to me, that's when mentoring really begins to set in for the individual because you're not just saying, okay, here, go do this. It's saying, no, this is what you did. Mm -hmm. This is what you just told me. Am I right? Yes. Now what's next? For the teacher, you know, because you're going into instructional leadership now, 
you're going to be working with teachers and adults. And for those, you know, folks that are thinking, okay, this is just another initiative that I have to do. What are some techniques that you have used in the past or will continue to use to shift that mindset, you know, to, to get them on board with the program or initiative from your campus? I think, again, starts with the grassroots and relationships. Yeah. Letting you know that, that I hear you and I see you. You know, uh, I think one of the most important things that we can do is let people know that they're heard. I think a lot of times in education, a lot of teachers become frustrated because they feel like my voice is not heard. And as a mentor and especially as an instructional leader, I think I believe my job is to kind of be the, the middleman between leadership and the teachers. So I have to be teacher enough to understand teachers, but I have to be administrative enough to understand the leaders and to be able to trans- transcribe and translate their vision to teachers. And also to be able to take the teacher's complaints and teacher's issues and go to the leadership, not with the complaints and the, and, and the grumblings, but with the plan and the strategy that will quiet the grumblings. You know, I can't go and say, mama, we hungry, but I can go in and say, mom, they, they, they haven't eaten, so but we have some bread and some peanut butter and jelly. Is it all right if we just go ahead and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches since there's no, no other food right now? Absolutely. I've stated what the problem was. I've given a solution, and now everybody's satisfied from what you're doing because ultimately that's all you want. You can't please everybody, but a, as a leader, I think the most important thing is to make sure that even though you don't try to please everyone, your goal is to connect with everyone so that they know that if I had the opportunity, you know that I would have. If it, if it was available, if that was an option, then we would have taken it. But this is what we had to go with at this time. I think being in the position, and I had the unique position of being able to be an instructional specialist over my mentor, who mentored me as a teacher. You know, so, who, and I tell everybody, I hands down, Kimberly Davis, I give her the hugest props ever because I was that student in school and I was that student my first year teaching. <laughs> uh, you know, where, you know, I, I was in the partying lifestyle. You know, I, I was I was going out, I was having fun, I was doing these things. When I would come in and she would see that I'm not right, she would instantly say, hey, still know you have a responsibility to do. I'm not gonna let you off the hook for doing what you're supposed to do just because now you feel like you, you were too grown to go to bed last night. And her being able to hold me accountable, albeit a totally different method than that, that I use, but still effective right. in getting me to see who I am and what my role is in this classroom. And then as a, as a specialist over, you know, working with her, I told her, I just want to, I want to continue that program because it worked for me as a teacher. Why wouldn't it work as, as a, as an instructional leader? You know, it's the same, same idea and same concept. And so I think that that being that I'm so freshly out of the classroom, I'm not someone, and I told my teachers when, when I accepted the position, this is a two-year gig for me at best, one to two-year gig. I'm trying to already see who wants to, who wants this position next right. and whomever wants it, talk with me. And so I can have, I know that you're part of this team that I'm going to imp- implement to say, now, how are we going to make this whole team work? Because again, if this is your aspiration, then I'll get you there. I don't want to be a career, you know, I'm not a career politician like that. You know, I believe you get in, you get somewhere, you conquer it, you you, you master what you need to do, and then you go to the next level right. and you bring someone else up that can fill that shoes and do that, do those same things and even better. Now, that's a wonderful mindset. And Kyle, I want to stay on this relationship building topic, but I want to flip the coin, right? So we were just were talking about relationship building with teachers as an instructional coach, but as far as teaching and working with students, what are you using in the classroom to help build relationships with your students? The first thing that I always have looked to, and this is something that I learned the importance of in this, in that span when Wilkie and I were teaching together across the courtyard, is you have to be authentic. It starts with authenticity. Because in that time when I was struggling, I tried on a bunch of different hats. I was trying to be a bunch of different things in the classroom. I couldn't figure out who I wanted to be because I didn't feel comfortable that I could be just who I was. But then there were times when Will and I would be chopping it up and we would be like throwing a football across the courtyard or we would be doing, we would just be doing dumb stuff. And then the kids were all like, oh, hey, Mr. K, like they want to see that. And there were several moments in that rough patch where I lost a lot out on relationships because 
they they had seen who I really was at times, but they got frustrated that that who wasn't who I was all the time. And over the course of that time, you realize that a relationship with a kid is a choice for them. Yes, we have a relationship with every kid in the classroom because we are in the same space as them and we teach them. But a re- like a real relationship has to be something that a kid chooses to have with you. Mm-hmm. So you have to open yourself up. You have to put yourself in that space and make yourself available. And it's not sharing everything the way I would share stuff with Will, but it's, yes, I listen to twangy Hank Williams <laughs> when, I'm, when I feel like it. You, you let the kids see the little pieces of you right. so they can choose to have that relationship with you. And then, you know, Wilkie talks about the most important piece of that relationship is to continue to maintain it, to cultivate it, to nurture it. You know, because we hear about relationships at the start of the year, you know, we do all these things, but in the, you know, in the winter months, when you're getting frustrated, it's hard. So you have to continually engage in that relationship. And for me, it's, it comes back to Wilkie's, you know, to be an observer, because not a lot of kids are going to come right out and just tell you stuff. But if you're listening when they're working in groups, if you're paying attention in the hallway, if you're around, you're going to have some kids be mad at you that you're eavesdropping, but there's going to be a ton of kids that are like, Oh, Hey, you know, I heard you say, how is your juggling group going? Or how was your recital or whatever this is? And then you wind up with kids being like, Hey, Mr. K, can I show you the video of my dance recital? Or, Hey, can you come to this? Or can you come to that? And that's when you know that relationship piece happens. But the thing that it, it really cultivates is that space, like Will said, where, you can talk to a kid and hold them accountable. Like, Hey, like this is what we're doing as a teacher. You are the middleman between the students and the admin. It's your job to interpret both parties to come up with. There's a term in the military called commander's intent, not reading the letter of the law, but understanding what the directive is. So for me, it's about having that empathy to say like, okay, kids, here's what we're going to do. And this is why we're going to do it. If you have a relationship with them, even if they think it's dumb, they're going to be willing to do it for you because it's you. Not necessarily that they agree with everything, but because they're like, okay, this is my teacher. And I think when it comes to that relationship piece, I think that's really where it's at. And and it's been, obviously over the last couple of years, it's been a struggle. You know, we had the year last year where the majority of kids Like we had a little eighth grade graduation get together and there were some kids that showed up that I was like, okay, that's, that's who you are. All right. I really didn't know who you were because I had only briefly seen blips on a screen. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that, that relationship piece to me, I mean, it starts and ends with authenticity. And, and one thing, you know, that Will talks about a ton too is, if you can find a way to admit your mistakes in front of kids, that really engenders you to them. It really helps build that relationships when you get, get in front of class and be like, yo, like here was the situation. I definitely didn't handle this correctly. I've, I've tried to make it right with these people and we're going to move on. I mean, those are the things that really, for me, feel like the truest sense of the relationship with the kid. You know, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about I started doing, I think it was in March, I committed myself to doing a Freestyle Friday. Hmm. And so I would normally do it after the end of the day when all the kids would leave and I would post it to TikTok just as something, just to kind of have my have fun for myself. Then I had kids who would say, Mr. Law, I saw your TikTok. Why you didn't challenge us? We did the Freestyle Friday with you. I was like, what? And so the most unexpected characters jumped up to do Freestyle Friday. These are not kids who had a desire to rap. These are not kids who you would look at and be like, oh, yeah, he, he wants to be a rapper or she wants to be a rapper. or she. No, these are like the quietest kids in my class. The quietest kids are the ones who got up and actually challenged me. And they, some of them were really good because they mastered the idea. They would hear me do it enough throughout the classroom. They're like, oh, so that's all you're doing is just talking about everything that you see. Exactly. And so the kids picked up on that again. They study you just like we study them. Yep. And they studied me so much to where the kids would say things in their raps that would trip me up when I had to go because I can't believe you even paid attention to that. When he was saying about that authenticity, 
Not saying these kids are aspiring rappers, but they were willing to put themselves out there and be vulnerable just because they saw me doing it. Their relationship with me gave them courage and strength to say, no, it's okay to put yourself out there. It's okay to make mistakes and slip up and, you know, and you can laugh at yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that part of the creation process is so important and critical because so many of our kids are afraid to make mistakes. We live in such a culture and a society where our kids feel like one mistake gives them a terminal, you know, a terminal sentence. Like I, death is imminent. I can't do anything else when it's not written. No. And I tell them all the time, I'm not the second chance teacher. I'm that teacher of another chance because I will constantly give you chances because I know you're in the process of learning. Yep. And I can't be angry with you every time you don't get it because that's only going to frustrate you, which is going to make you more prone to make those mistakes versus let's make you comfortable. Let's give you the courage so that now you can see what it looks like. You know, and I always tell teachers, you got to model the behavior you want to, you want your students to see. Yeah. You have to model that learning. You have to model that getting things wrong. You have to model that recovery so that they can feel comfortable doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Well, Wilkie, I want to talk about the, the poster behind you. It's got a beautiful lighthouse on it. Yeah. And, uh, I know that's one of your guys' projects, and, and the both of you could probably talk about it, but the Lighthouse Educator Development nonprofit that you both have, I, I want to learn a little bit about that and, and where that idea came from. Strictly from a conversation. Kyle and I were talking, and, and we knew that from our conversations, we saw that some of the same things that I needed to do to develop myself are the same things that I injected into him to do to make himself a better teacher. And we started saying to ourselves, these are things that all teachers need, but we know that most districts are not going to put money behind a relationship guru, so to speak. And especially our whole theme and everything that we deal with is about first, you got to deal with your personal self. You know, start with personal development. You can't be a great teacher until you have developed yourself. You're almost kind of like your, your own project zero. You know, you have to make it work for yourself first. And so we kept going back and forth, LLC, nonprofit. We do an LLC. Oh, we can make a lot of money. If we do a nonprofit, we can do a whole lot of good. You know what I mean? So it's like, which one do you want to go for? And we just said, hey, you know, we really want to do good. We don't want teachers to have to say, you have to go broke in order to get the training that you need to be successful in the classroom. Right. And so that's kind of where it came from. And the term lighthouse came about, the, the, the name Lighthouse came about because we kept saying we're the beacon. Like if you think about it being foggy and you're trying to navigate everything in, in your school and in the classroom and you don't know where shore is, you know, that three to five year crash, most teachers do, yep. you know, because they don't have the right guidance. They don't have, they don't have that vantage point to say, there's a light down there. And if it's there, that means there's land there. So let's just go, as far as we can, drop anchor, get into the dinghy, and go to shore. So we don't, you know, so now we can get what we need, get back in the boat, and go back to doing what we're doing. And that's kind of what we want to do, be a, a haven, a, be, a, be a, a rest haven, a safe haven for teachers to come in and to get what they need in order to go back out and do what they need to do. And the initial vision was to have lighthouse, lighthouse keepers in different cities to where we could have those those training facilities to where we can actually focus and really intensely deal with teachers and help them understand how to first deal with yourself in order to be able to deal with your students and to master your craft. Yeah, and and I think the, the biggest point that we always, that we hope to sell, you know, teachers on is that there isn't a one size fit all professional development. Mm -hmm because there's not a one size fit all kid. Like Wilkie talks about this all the time. Every, not just every year you have different classes, every day you have different classes. Yep. It's the same group of 25 kids and they're different every single day. Mm. So for us, 
the things that we are we are building and you know i was the dreamer that said like if we go llc we'll blow this thing up and in three years well i'm gonna be tony robbins like <laughs> obviously seven years later it's it's not but we've learned from the bumps and bruises and like and you know like i said i don't know if we said it on air or off air but you know we were really starting to hit our stride a couple of years ago but you know things happened and so much has changed you know, in my life, like in that time, you know, I bought a house and got married in the pandemic, like Wilkie's daughter is about to be a junior in high school, like so much of even just over the seven years since we started this thing, we've grown so, so much, but ultimately we wanted to see ourselves as a place where like teacher, you know, like Will said that teachers can come and revisit, like you don't, the lighthouse is not a place where you live. It's a place where you stay. And even if we could just be like the people people turn to when they're in a rough patch, if we could just be that for a teacher who's saying like, you know, I'm really struggling, but you know, I'm getting talked to about interactive notebooks and now I'm getting talked to about digital portfolios. And now I'm getting, you know, like I just need someone to, give me some feedback and tell me, you know, give me a lay of the land. Mm -hmm. And, and even if it's just, you know, whether it's our podcast or, you know, this mentoring program that we've worked on or down the road, the book, even if we just can do something that like Will said, gives that teacher who's, whether it's three years or 30 years, a chance to stay in that little bit longer I mean, it really makes a difference. I mean, cause I don't, I'm not sure where you guys are at down there, but you know, you talk to a lot of people and it feels like there's a lot of people that are pulling the ripcord. Same down here. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about a uh, maturation or an involvement of you guys as people and in the program as far as the lighthouse educator development program. But I want to talk about the, you know, evolution of your podcast. Where did that start from? And and where are you now with the relaunch? Okay, so for the record, for at least at least a year before we did our first episode, I told Will we should do a podcast. And that was like 20, 2014, 15, when like podcasts were like growing, but they still weren't like ubiquitous ubiquitous like they are now. No, yeah. And it started with he and I in the dining room of my house when I still lived in Houston, just talking about stuff. We've gone through several variations of names. The the new relaunch soon that's coming is it's we're gonna finally I think we're finally set on a name. It's gonna be We Teach Inspired. It's been the ABCs of Inspired Teaching. It's been the LED Project podcast. It's been Value Adds Value. But over the course of that time, we've done almost four hundred shows. Wow. The evolution. I think the biggest thing about it is it's it's almost a diary of how we've changed mm -hmm. and how we've handled situations and how we've a lot of it is super super reflective if we could do one thing it would be to inspire um and wilkie loves the uh you know the the etymology of the word inspire is to breathe life into yeah and that's what we want our podcast to be is a podcast that just breathes life into people you know getting a chance to have conversations with people like you or who whoever a teacher is and you know, giving a voice to teachers who may not have one, or even just like I said, you know, when we were off air, I talked about how much better I felt about the profession when we were consistently doing the podcast and I was talking to people. And even if they didn't feel like things were great, I knew that I wasn't alone in this thing and they were in it with me and they were going through a lot of the same things. So ultimately we teach inspired, which is going to come out right at the end of school. Um, you can still get all of our old podcasts are still available uh, currently on um, all the platforms. It's called the ABCs of Inspired Teaching, but ultimately it's just getting back to that root of, you know, trying to breathe life into teachers and the profession is, is where we're at. All right, gentlemen, I want to know about how people connect with you because I know a lot of folks are going through, like you said, a, a rough patch and potentially are looking for guidance and, and need life you know, breathe into them. So how can they get a hold of you, connect with you? Where can they turn to, to get that information? For me, 
uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and TikTok at it's Kyle Krieger. Um, and that's spelled K-R-U-E-G-E-R. Um, we do have a website. It's called the ledproject.com, which stands for the Lighthouse Educator Development Project. Um, and we also have uh, a business Instagram that will be undergoing a change to We Teach Inspired sometime soon as well. For me, it's simple. At its.will.law with one L dot I, I, I on most socials. And like I say, the website, my email, I'm open. My email's open, Wilkie at the ledproject.com. And Kyle at the ledproject.com. LED I forgot that part too. Good job. Yeah. I don't mean, like I say, I, I tell teachers anytime, like anytime you want to collaborate on an idea, email me. I, I'm, I'm wide open. Uh, if, like I said, as long as it's not something that's going to take me too far outside of my path or what I need to do, I am so committed to this craft and what we do that I open myself up. And that's one of the reasons we started a nonprofit is because like, look, you know, I'd rather us do the grunt work to try to find grant funding to, to do this so that other people don't have to, so that they can understand that there is value here and you don't have to spend you know, $600 a conference to go from conference to conference to conference just to get, you know, quality PD hours yeah. and, and to get quality mentorship. You know, uh, I, I consider anybody who asks me questions about what I do and challenge my thinking as a, as a mentor to me, you know, and I'm in several circles now where there's a lot of people who just ask, us, ask me questions about what I'm doing and what my thinking is, and that helps me to fine tune and sharpen my tools up for my craft. So like I said, again, if you're, if you're in need of something, reach out. Yeah, please we'll reach out. Here. I love it. Well, gentlemen, you guys are just killing it. I, I love everything that you're producing and, and I love your heart. I love how much that you are pouring into other educators and to my listeners, please make sure you're connecting with these two amazing gentlemen. Um, I'm gonna have everything in the show notes as far as their podcast, social media, uh, links. So make sure that you're checking out their podcasts and everything that they are producing. And they're not lying to you. If you have a question or you're seeking some wisdom in some, some form, some way, definitely reach out and they will get you some sort of answer or, or maybe an amazing question to help guide you in your journey. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the Aspire Lead podcast. Yeah, man, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time and the wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. And to all the listeners, please take our words to heart. Reach out. Don't struggle alone. You're not in this alone. And we take unsolicited invitations uh, on the podcast. If you are a teacher and you hear this and you've never been on a podcast or you've been on a hundred, reach out and we will schedule a time with you and we'll we'll wrap. Now you're going to get a bunch of folks now. I hope so. It would make <laughs> it, that would make it the best summer ever. <laughs>